everybody. I am Christiana Limniatis, Director of Preservation Services for Preservation Buffalo Niagara. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for this historic tax credit workshop. Um, so we are in a webinar format. Uh, so tonight when you have questions, which I hope that you will have questions, I expect and, and, and am excited to answer your questions. So when you have those questions, um, because you can't unmute yourself, here, <laughs> hi Mary, uh, because you can't unmute yourself because we are in that webinar format, you're gonna have to use our Q&A function to be able to ask those questions. So if you're, you're newish to, to Zoom, you know, just wiggle your mouse around, touch the screen, and you'll see that Q&A box pop up. If you have a question that you definitely want me to answer live during this program, make sure it goes into that. Uh, we do have the chat box. If you have other kind of side comments or, 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 or other things to mention, you can certainly use that chat, but it definitely makes it a lot easier for me um, to keep track of questions if you use that Q&A box. Um, with that, we are going to get started. Uh, before we get into the nitty gritty about historic tax credits, let's just take a second to introduce us again. I'm Christiana from Preservation Buffalo Niagara. We are your local preservation advocacy organization. While we have Buffalo and Niagara in our title, we actually provide services to the five westernmost counties of New York State. So again, whether you're in Jamestown or in Lockport, we are your resource. We are here to help you on your preservation adventure. Um, you know, our mission statement here, it's a very broad mission statement here to identify, protect, and promote our unique architecture and historic legacy and to connect people to the places they love in Western New York. When we're doing this work, when we're trying to accomplish this mission, it's easy for us to kind of divide our work into four main categories, uh, education, technical service, advocacy, and community development. Tonight is a perfect example of education, here to provide you with the information you need to better understand your historic built environment and then better to protect your historic built environment. Technical service, we and the rest of the staff members here were always available to answer any questions you have preservation related, anything old building related, uh, whether that's a materiality type question, you have a part of your building that you're having an issue with and you don't know how to address it. We can definitely give you guidance or connect you to experts who can give you that guidance. Uh, but also when it comes to preservation planning questions, you're trying to landmark something, you're trying to do your historic tax credit application, you have questions about that kind of stuff, we're here to help as well. And then when it comes to advocacy and community development, they're basically the same exact thing, but advocacy is where we are taking the lead in fighting to save a building, um, advocating for legislation that will support historic preservation work and community development is where we come into your community and give you the tools um, and, and, and knowledge that you need to be in charge of your own preservation destiny. Like I said, we have a five county service area. Um, and so even independent of the pandemic and all of those kinds of regulations, it, it's, it's, it's impossible for us to be at every single meeting, speak at every single hearing. So making sure that you have what you need to be able to advocate to, for your resources is incredibly important to us. Um, and then lastly, I uh, just am um, contractually obligated to, to thank our sponsors. Erie County uh, provides us with some funding to support our educational programming. Thank you so much. Um, as well as our PBN membership. Um, while we can go to specific uh, you know, types of funders to um, help support specific types of projects, the vast majority of our work, that day-to-day -day advocacy to save buildings is really not stuff that we can write grants to uh, cover, uh, to finance. And so it is our membership dollars, our donations, our sponsorships um, that make that work possible. So thank you to the few of the, some of you who, when you registered this evening for to this evening's event, made a donation. Thank you so very much. Again, it's people like that that allow us to do our work, that support us to do our work and help us keep our educational programming free or extremely low cost. Um, so if you do learn things tonight and have a fun time, I like to think I do a good presentation, I encourage you to head over to our website preservationbuffaloniagara.org uh, to see the other ways that you can support us in our work. 
And with that, let's get to tax credits. <laughs> uh, so first, we're just going to cover some basic preservation terminologies and policies that you are going to encounter and see as part of your pr the process of doing historic tax credit application. So just kind of going over those terms, so they're not so foreign sounding to you anymore. Um, and then we're going to go through the nuts and bolts of the eligibility requirements and how the program works in general. And then we will actually walk through an application process from start to finish. Um, and for those of you who have just joined while I was doing all that, again, just want to remind you that you will not be able to unmute yourself to ask questions. So definitely make sure to use that Q&A box uh, for any questions that you have and just put it in there as soon as it pops into your brain and I'll be able to stop and answer it um, as soon as I can. All right, basic preservation information. What is historic preservation? Um, essentially, I mean, here is a fancy definition that I think I got from the National Park Service, uh, but essentially preservation is when a community comes together, whether that's a neighborhood, a, 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 a hamlet, a, a municipality, a region, whatever that community is, comes together and identifies the resources that they value and then collectively take steps to ensure that those resources continue to be a part of their community, continue to be used and viable. Um, when we do preservation work, uh, there's pretty much two spheres in which we do this work. There's the public sphere and then the private sphere. The public sphere is going to be those non, um, excuse me, those governmental agencies and authorities that regulate historic preservation. So at the national level, that's going to be the National Park Service. At the state level, each state has a historic preservation office. That's called SHPO for short, State Historic Preservation Office, SHPO. And then if you have a local preservation ordinance on the books, then you'll also have a preservation board or commission that would regulate on the local level. And then on the private side, we have certainly all of those for profit consultants and tradespeople who you can hire to help you do your preservation work, but then also us nonprofits that are here to provide that advocacy and technical service. Um, and equal, you know, the same as with the public sphere, we have different organizations um, on different levels of, of municipality, of different levels of government. So we have a national organization, the National Trust for Historic Preservation. There's the Preservation League of New York State, and then us, PBN, as your local um, advocacy organization. One thing to keep in mind about advocacy organizations, about nonprofits, uh, while these three nonprofits I just outlined on the screen are defined by geographic boundaries, they'll help any anyone within that boundary. There are also a, uh, nonprofits that work on certain types of buildings. So there's nonprofits that help you with barns. There's nonprofits that help you with modern buildings. So again, depending on what your preservation project is, there might be additional resources out there for you to reach out to. Um, saving buildings isn't new. This is something I like to include in every presentation I do to make people understand and to kind of uh, demystify this process is this preservation and all of these wonderful things that we use to protect our built environment is not new. We've been doing preservation under some sort of title uh, since the beginning of this nation. And so here is a, you know, a nice little abbreviated uh, list of kind of the greatest hits of, of events in preservation history um, on local, state, and national levels, all kind of ending up and culminating with the 1966 Historic Preservation Act signed by LBJ. That's a film strip of him actually signing it. Why does it matter? Why do you need to know this? It's important to know this because it is this law that establishes the federal policy and framework for completing preservation. And it's this law that even makes the tax credit process possible. The rules and the um, policies that we use as part of the tax credit program were enabled by this act. So again, we wouldn't have the tax credits if it wasn't for this preservation act back in the 60s. So important to keep that in mind. All right, some key terms for us to get to know. First is character defining feature. So a character defining feature is going to be all of those visual aspects and physical features that comprise your historic building. So that's gonna be all of those kind of decorative elements that you can see. You know, if you have a Victorian era house, a Queen Anne style house, it might have a lot of spindle work on the outside, lots of carved doodads, or maybe some decorative tile work. Those are all character defining features, uh, ornate wrought iron railings, anything like that, that's a character defining feature. Any element that helps to, to articulate the style and the architecture of that resource or the time period or its history, 
character defining features. Character defining features also include that general massing and layout and form of your structure too. So it's not just the little individual decorative items, but it's also those kind of bigger picture elements of your, of your building as well. Why is it important to know what a character defining feature is? It's because the whole tax, the whole point of the tax credit program is to preserve as much of those character defining features as possible while still allowing you and helping you make those necessary modern changes that you need so you can continue using your house. So being able to identify and recognize what those character defining features of your home is, uh, what, uh, what those are is really important so then you can then make sure to craft your project in a way that won't permanently damage those elements. We'll talk more about that as we go on. Contributing resources. Um, actually, I'm gonna skip that. I'm gonna go to the next one. I didn't realize this was in a different order. Uh, the National Register of Historic Places, the NRHP or just the NR or National Register. It's the federal government's official listing of building sites, structures, objects that have been deemed worthy of preservation for their historic significance. So the National Register isn't a just a listing of all of our historic places because there's tons of history in this country. We've been here, you know, col we've colonized this land for over 200 years. Lots of things have been written in our official history books, right? It's not just about being significant. It's that it's worthy of preservation, meaning that that building retains enough architectural integrity that relates to what makes it significant. Why is it important to know what the National Register is? It's because listing on the National Register of Historic Places is one of the eligibility requirements. So you need to be able to confirm that your building is in fact listed on the National Register either, either individually or as part of a historic district. Coming back to that definition for contributing resources, when we have a historic district defined and listed on the National Register, it's a geographic boundary. So every resource, every building within that geographic boundary is listed on the National Register. But some, but they are all identified as either being contributing resources or non-contributing resources. A contributing resource meaning that that individual building, either through its architecture or social history, contributes to the narrative of the history and architectural significance of the whole district, that it supports whatever that broader narrative is for the whole district. Whereas a non-contributing resource, either because of its architecture or social history, does not is not in the same story, does not support that narrative. Why is it important to know what a contributing resource is? Because if you are listed on the National Register as part of a historic district, we need, you need to, we need to check to make sure your building is a contributing resource because only contributing resources are eligible for the tax credit. And then that last definition um, actually isn't really relevant to Jamestown property owners because you guys don't have certified local historic districts, but in addition to being, you know, being eligible, that eligibility requirement of being listed on the National Register, properties in certified local districts can also get take advantage of tax credits. Currently, the city of Buffalo is the only municipality in Western New York that has a certified local district. So again, for you guys in Jamestown, you don't have to worry about that. You just need to make sure that your building is listed on the National Register. Um, the four approaches for the treatment of historic properties. So when we have just you know, regular conversation, we interchangeably use the word preservation, rehabilitation, and restoration, right? You bought a building, you're rehabbing it, you're preserving it, you're restoring it. And that's fine for everyday conversation. But technically speaking, in the professional preservation world, these terms relate to different approaches to how to treat a building. If you're going to preserve it, it means something different than if you're rehabbing it, restoring it, or reconstructing it. Each of these different approaches come with their own set of standards and guidelines that explains what does it mean to preserve versus rehabilitate or reconstruct or, or restore. Why does this matter? <laughs> it matters because it is one of these sets of standards and guidelines that are used in reviewing your application. And it is the standards and guidelines of rehabilitation that the State Preservation Office, SHPO, is going to use in reviewing your application process. Why is it the standards of rehabilitation that are used? And that's because, as you see on the screen, the standards of rehabilitation, the treatment of rehabilitation is the only one 
that is written to allow for modern changes for continued use while also preserving those character defining features. When you follow the treatment of preservation or restoration or reconstruction, it's all about freezing your building in a particular moment of time and not really making those dramatic changes to update and modernize. It's all about that historic integrity and taking it backwards or freezing it in this current moment. It's the standards of rehabilitation that allow you to make those modern changes. Because the whole point of this program is not to make you live in a historic house museum, to live in this, you know, uh, blast from the past kind of place. It's about keeping all those wonderful historic things, keeping that integrity of the building, but getting you those modern things that you need that your building didn't come with. I mean, I think we all have to understand that most houses, if your house was built before the 1920s, you might not have even had closets in your house. So even as simple as those types of things, those are alterations that were made to allow those buildings to keep you know, up for modern use and standards. Uh, so again, it's those treatment of rehabilitation that we need to make sure that your project in your application meets those standards and guidelines. Uh, you can read up and learn all about the standards of rehabilitation on the National Park Service's website. The blue box that you see on the right hand side are the actual standards. It's a set of 10 principles, the essential, like what it means to do rehabilitation. And then those 10 standards are expanded upon and kind of, um, you know, uh, given you know, recommendations of what it means to do those standards in relation to different aspects of your building. So you can go to their website and they have a book. That's what the cover, this top image is, is the cover of the huge book that has all the standards and guidelines for all the four treatments. Highly encourage you, definitely worth it. You should go and peruse this information on the National Park Service's website. Um, but for, the, for tonight's purposes, the cheat sheet, the cliff notes of what it means to follow the standards of rehabilitation. It's all about retaining, repairing, and, uh, repairing, and then replacing in kind. So again, we wanna retain as much of that original character defining historic materials. It is that the fact that you have those historic materials that makes you eligible for the tax credit program in the first place. So we wanna make sure that we're retaining as much of that as possible. In retaining those, we want to make sure that we are then repairing those elements, right? We want to make sure that our repair methods are of the least intervention possible, right? We don't want our repair methods to cause permanent damage of those materials. I think the best example to kind of explain that is with sandblasting, right? Uh, you have paint on a brick wall. That's a problem for you. You want to take off that paint and you sandblast it your problem of the paint has been solved. But in removing that paint and sandblasting that top layer of your brick, you've actually created a whole host of other problems uh, and allowing water to infiltrate your brick, which is gonna cause structural damages and huger, huger headaches than that paint would have made. So again, we wanna address those problems, but we wanna do it with the least degree of intervention so we are not causing new or other types of problems. And then that replace in kind. No matter how much of a diehard preservationist you are, we have to admit that materials have a lifespan. There will come a time where we can no longer repair that element, that part of your building, whatever it is, it's time to repair, replace it. And if we are gonna be forced and our only option is to replace, we wanna make sure that that replacement is as in kind as possible. So that means that that replacement material is going to match the original in all of its qualities and its color and its shape, and making sure that that is in kind and not a completely departure from that original design and, and, and feeling in, uh, of that element. Um, so that is the standards of rehabilitation. <laughs> uh, that is the last of our definitions to go over. A very, very quick overview of those things. Again, reminder for those who have just joined, uh, if you have questions as I'm talking, feel free to just put them in that Q&A box. All right, let's go over the actual, you know, programs, what the historic tax credits are, what their eligibility requirements and everything like that. So we talk about historic tax credits. There are two different tax credits. Other people like to discuss them by saying the state, talk about them by the level of government they come from, right? So talk about the state credits versus the federal credits. And that's incredibly confusing in my opinion. Um, it's a lot easier to talk about it from the type of building and the use of that building that you're doing. So if you are a homeowner with looking for a homeowner tax credit, that is going to be a 20% state tax credit. And then there is also a commercial 
income producing tax credit. So if that is a building that you do not live in and you make income off of that building, you are eligible for the commercial tax credit. And that is a 40% combined state and federal tax credit. Let's take a little bit look at the homeowner tax credit. So it's full proper name is the New York State Historic Home Ownership Rehabilitation Credit. Again, it gives you a 20% state tax credit on those qualified rehabilitation expenditures. Um, we kind of say it in regular conversation that it's just a 20% on your project costs, but there are some types of project costs that are not eligible. And we're gonna talk about those in a couple of slides. Um, the key thing, key eligibility requirement, biggest thing is that all this work needs to be pre-approved by the State Preservation Office, by SHPO. Your work needs to meet those standards of rehabilitation. That's what they're going to use to review it. It needs to be in accordance with the guidelines that they give with that, right? So because of that, they need to pre-approve your work to make sure what your plan is does meet the standards. And if what you're planning to do doesn't, then they'll work with you to figure out that best way forward so we can be as close to following the standards, as close as we can to be preserving all of those character-defining features, while also getting you that update that you need and fixing that problem that you have with your building. It's a homeowner credit, so obviously it has to be an owner-occupied residence, and obviously kind of, a, a, you know, this seems silly to have to mention, but I, I feel like it does need to be mentioned. It's a state tax credit. So you have to pay state taxes to be able to claim this credit. There are little loopholes with that, and we'll talk about that in a second. But if you have multiple properties and you claim a different house in a different state um, as your primary residence, then, then you can't use the tax credits on uh, here because it's not your owner-occupied primary residence. So keeping that in mind. Um, Financial requirements of this program, you have to spend at least $5,000. Um, so a minimum, you have to spend $5,000. And of whatever it is that you end up spending, 5% has to be spent on the exterior. And exterior costs, anything on that the envelope of your building counts as exterior costs. Um, so, you know, there's the obvious examples of painting your house or fixing up a window or something like that, but also foundation repairs. Even if you're doing those repairs inside your basement, that's still an exterior, technically an exterior um, uh, work. So again, at least spending $5,000 with 5% on the exterior. As I mentioned before on the definitions page, you have to be listed on the National Register of Historic Places either individually or as part of a historic district um, or in a certified local historic district for those in Buffalo. Um, and then the last requirement is that you either need to be located in a qualified census tract or in a city with a population of under 1 million and with at least 15% poverty threshold. And it has to be an actual city, right? So every city in, the, in Western New York, Jamestown included, Buffalo, um, Niagara Falls, all of us fit in that definition. So for every historic district in the city limits of Jamestown, you don't have to worry about what census tract you're in. You're just automatically you're gonna be eligible as long as you meet those other eligibility requirements. Um, if you don't live in that city and you live in, in villages or towns or whatnot, then you do need to check that qualified census tract rule and see if your census tract is a qualified one. A qualified census tract is one where the median family income is at or below the state median income. And the last thing to keep in mind with this tax credit is that if you, uh, make $60,000 or less, it is not a credit, you will get this as a refund. Um, so again, if you are in a fixed income under $6,000, um, you will get that credit as an actual tax in your refund when you file your taxes. Um, briefly, just going over the commercial credit, just to give that general idea, but the rest of this presentation, I'm focusing on the homeowner credit. Um, but the homeowner credit was created based on how the, the commercial credit was. So understanding the homeowner credit, if you're interested in the commercial, will still help you through this process. But just to get those you know, broad, um, the big bullet points of what the commercial credit is, it's a 40% combined state and federal credit. So you'll get a 20% from the state and you'll get 20% from the federal government. Um, again, just like with the homeowner credit, it has to be pre-approved. It needs to be a commercial income producing property, obviously. Um, with this, 
tax credit, it's not a flat amount that you have to spend more over. Your project costs, you have to spend more than the adjusted basis or the adjusted value of your property. So if you just bought a building for $100,000 and you need to do work and you want to use the tax credits for it, you have to spend over $100,000 because you just bought it at that cost. So that's your adjusted basis. That's the adjusted value of that building. If you've owned the building for quite a while, there's a couple math equations you can do to figure out what your adjusted basis is, but you have to spend over that value. You have to spend over that value because this is a substantial credit. You're getting 40% tax credit. So you need to spend, you need to have a substantial rehab project. The same as with the homeowner credit, you have to be listed on the national register or in a certified district. You have to be either in a qualified census tract or in a city of a population or in that rule of the uh, city population. And then the other thing to keep in mind if you are pursuing commercial tax credits is that there was a recent change in state legislation just a couple of months ago that now allows for a 30% state tax credit for projects that are spending $2 million or less. So for those projects, you're not going to get 40, you're going to get a 50% tax credit when it's all said and done. Uh, where can you get information about all of these tax credit programs? From SHPO's website. They are the administrator. I am here. Preservation Buffalo Niagara is certainly here to help you through this entire process and give you our guidance and advice. But SHPO is the administrator of this program. Um, so if you head over to that website, that's where you'll find the application forms and different info sheets. Um, after this workshop, you guys are going to get a thank you email. And it'll have direct links to this website and to all the other things that we're mentioning and, and that will help you in your tax credit adventure. Uh, so no need to hurry and rush and write this down right now. Um, when we talk about how you need to be eligible, to be eligible, you have to be listed on the National Register or in a certified local district, uh, you can head over to SHPO's website, CRIS, which is the Cultural Resource Information System. And you can use this website to double check and see if you are listed on the National Register and if your building is a contributing resource or a non-contributing resource. Certainly use this. It's, it's a little tricky to get the hang of it at first, but it's it's pretty straightforward website that you can use. But you can always call me <laughs> or reach out to Mary at uh, the Re Jamestown Renaissance Corp to get connected to me and be able and we can help you double check to see if your, your address is listed and stuff. Um, here is that map of Jamestown and what those historic districts are. You guys, for you know, a pretty moderate sized city in Western New York, you guys have three historic districts. And I think that that's a really amazing thing. You have some other communities that are similar size to you guys and they have one maybe. Um, so great job, JRC, for all your work in getting these historic districts. Uh, there's the Lakeview Avenue Historic District that was designated 2016, the Jamestown Commercial District that was the first one in 2014. And then the newest one was the Forest Heights Historic District just not last year, two years ago. What year is it? Yes, two years ago. And we know that um, they, you guys are working on surveying another neighborhood. So maybe in the next year or two, there's going to be a fourth historic district that will be able to access these tax credits. Um, here is an example from the Forest Heights Historic District nomination, where you can see how to check that contributing non-contributing resource note, right? So when you look into that historic, into the nomination, it's going to clearly say if your resource is contributing or if it's non-contributing. So that's what we need to double check in those when we look at those nominations. All right, so to those qualified rehabilitation expenditures, basically it is, what is tax credit eligible is almost every single thing that you could possibly imagine to do to your house from your roof to your foundation that is a permanent improvement to that property, right? So replacing your roof, painting the exterior, um, fixing masonry walls, fixing your foundation, um, switching out and upgrading your, your heating, your mechanical systems, either keeping what you have and having it work better or subbing it out and improving it and doing something new. You see on that list, the geothermal heating systems. If you have one system now and you wanna put on a different one, that's gonna be tax credit eligible. But there's also some of those soft costs that are also tax credit eligible. Um, your fees or what you're paying an architect, an engineer, a preservationist, um, your permits, those are also tax credit eligible as well. Um, so here's just, you know, a list. It's not an exhaustive list. It's not every single thing that's, that is tax credit eligible, but it's kind of those big, the biggest things, the most common things. 
And then here we look at those expenses that are not going to qualify for tax credits. And it's pretty much all of those temporary improvements, those removable things, as well as things that are outside the footprint of your building. Um, unfortunately, this tax credit, the homeowner tax credit, only applies to the residents, to the home. It does not apply to secondary buildings like garages or carriage houses, to landscaping, to your driveway, or any other type of paving. It is just the, within the footprint of the actual property. That rule has nothing to do with preservation stuff. That's literally because of the tax code and things like that. So it is rather unfortunate because especially in Jamestown, I know that there's some of those houses that um, still have their historic carriage barns or other types of secondary structures that are historic um, and might be deemed a contributing resource, but because of how the tax code is written, we can't use the tax, uh, the tax credit on those elements. So again, alarm systems, appliances, those temporary things that you could move out with you when you left that building are not going to be tax credit eligible. All right, so that is the nuts and bolts of the eligibility requirements. Again, any questions, feel free to put them in the chat box and the Q&A box. All right, let us walk through an actual homeowner application process. This is the general process that we're talking about, right? First, you have to submit your part one and two forms. That's that pre-approval paperwork so that SHPO knows that and can, can and evaluate if your work meets the secretary of uh, you know the standards of rehabilitation. So they'll get your application package, review it and approve it as long as what you're doing is good. Um, and then they'll send you an okay, you know, an approval letter. Uh, you'll start your work. You'll finish it when you finish it. There's not really a time limit on how long it takes you. When you're done and ready to close out that tax credit application, you'll submit your part three form, which shows what you did and that you did what you said you were gonna do. And then SHPO re reviews that. And if you did what you said you were gonna do the way you were supposed to do it, they will certify your project and then you'll be able to claim that credit on that year's tax return. When we say that you're sending your package to SHPO, what we're saying, what we mean is that you're physically mailing a package application to Albany, to um, Peebles Island is where you're specifically sending it to, just north of Albany. Um, so it is a physical application package. It is not something that is digitally submitted as of right now. Uh, so in that package, whether it's your pre-approval form or your after completion form, you're sending the actual application form. We'll look at that form in a second. You're gonna be including photographs of your property burned onto a CD or put on a thumb drive. They are starting to accept these photographs through, you know, cloud-based photographs and, and drop boxes and things. Um, so if you are interested in doing that way, definitely reach out to me and, and I can help you navigate that process. All of those photographs need to be then keyed to a site plan because these people are not coming to, to look at your house. All they're going to do to review it is your pictures. So not only by giving them all the pictures of your house, but you need to make a little map so they understand what those pictures are showing them. Um, and then there is an application fee for both application forms. One of those fees could be waived if you meet the requirements, and we'll talk about that in a second. And then the last thing that you might need to include if your project requires is those drawings and cut sheets. If you are proposing to make changes to a character defining feature, then you need to have those architectural drawings or manufacturing drawings um, so that SHPO reviewers know what that thing is going to look like at the end of it, right? If you want to change out a window, you had a fire and your original wood windows were damaged and you want to build a new one or install a, a replacement window, you need to have a drawing of what that window is going to look like so they can review and make sure it's an in-kind replacement. If you're turning a former closet into a bathroom because you need another bathroom, you need to have the architectural drawings to show how that bath, how that's going to work so they can ensure that it's meeting the standards. Here is that homeowner application part one and two form, and it is literally called part one and two. That's because they recently, right before the pandemic, they redid all of these application forms, and previously it was three separate forms. Um, and instead of totally renumbering the process, they just combined these two. Now, the reason they wouldn't want to renumber the process is because the commercial credit is three separate forms. And so they just wanted to maintain that symmetry to that program. 
App, this is the application form, the first two pages of it, simple fill in the blanks and check boxes about inf confirming that you are the homeowner, that your, your project is eligible, that your address is eligible, and just confirming all of those eligibility requirements on this form. Uh, the big thing to, to be mindful of on this form, on the second page specifically, um, is the signature page, the signature lines down here. If you own the property with someone else, all the owners have to sign it. Um, so if you live with the person you own it with, super easy, just turn to them and ask them to sign it. But if you live in, if you don't live in the house with the co-owner, uh, then you need to make sure that you get them to sign it. Um, and then the other thing is this income waiver part. I said before that there's application fees. With this application, there is a flat $25 to five application fee. But if you make $60,000 or less, you don't have to pay that $25 fee. But in exchange for that, you have to get this notarized saying that you promise you're telling the truth that you make $60,000 or less. So again, if you wanna take advantage of not needing, if you're eligible and don't need to pay that $25, you will need to instead get this notarized. And then the third page and, and you know, all, only other page of this application form is this simple spreadsheet where you're going to list out what you're gonna do on your project, list out all the scopes of work that you're gonna do. And that's what you wanna do. You wanna list out by scopes of work. You don't necessarily want to list out by the, the part of the house or the room that you're working in. For example, if you're doing a kitchen remodel, you're updating your you know, very Laura Ashley kitchen from the 80s and you want it something more modern, that's perfectly fine. Um, but when you say kitchen remodel, that's a lot of things that's gonna go into a kitchen remodel. And so to list out all those things in one line is gonna be confusing for, for you to keep track and for them to review and make sure that you're meeting the standards. So you wanna separate those things out by scope of work. So the flooring, the cabinetry, the plumbing, and again, all of that stuff that you're gonna be doing, you're painting the house, you're painting the whole house, new fresh coats, um, you're re doing the floors, you know, having it by scope of work. This application form is a fancy fillable PDF, so you can literally just type right into it. I've seen people print it out and handwrite on it, as long as your handwriting is leg eligible. That's perfectly fine as well. Me personally, I like to recreate this spreadsheet in an Excel document and, and, you, and use it in there. The main reason why I like to do that is because... Uh, Full disclosure, I'm a dyslexic person. And so I like to be able to have that option of spell checking in Excel to make sure I'm writing the things that I wanna write. So personally for me, I like Excel, but you can certainly just use the form as it is. The columns on this form, photo number, title of work proposed, existing condition, proposed work, and your estimated cost. Let's figure out, let's talk a little bit more how we would fill those in. And SHPO gives us an instruction sheet that goes along with this application form. And here are their examples of how we would fill out that form. So this first line is roofing, again, by scope of work. Obviously that coincides with the part of the house it is, but you know what I'm trying to say there. <laughs> um, so the photo numbers, again, you have to have photographs of your building and we're gonna talk about how to take those photos and how they need to be organized in a second, but you need to have those photos and they need to be labeled and keyed to a site plan. So numbering those photos is the most logical and easiest way to do that. So you need to put what photo number shows that roof or whatever that thing that you're talking about what are the pictures that that reviewer can quickly flip to, to be able to see what you're talking about? The title of the work, roofing. What is the existing condition? It's worn out, leaking asphalt shingle roof. Simple and straightforward to the point. Could you write paragraphs explaining in detail how it's worn out, how it's leaking, the, all the failings of that asphalt shingle roof? Sure, you could do that. Do you need to? No, please don't. Simple and straightforward to the point. You just need to describe it enough that they understand what the problem is <laughs> and what's going on. Um, and the same thing with your proposed work. What are you gonna do? You're gonna install new three tab asphalt shingles, including all repairs, underlayment, et cetera. You want it to be specific and simple enough and straightforward to the point that they understand what you're going to do, but not so ambiguous that like things are clouded, right? You also don't want to be so specific in describing what you're going to do, because if, if you vary the teeniest tiniest from that plan, you will need to file an amendment to make sure that your work will, will still 
be tax credit eligible, right? What's an example of that? An example of that, I was working on a big tax credit project one time with multiple buildings and each of us consultants had a different building. And when we were filling out our forms and talking about the interior woodwork, all of us consultants just said we were gonna repair and replace in kind all the interior trim. One consultant went as far as to describe the molding profile that that trim had, saying that they were going to maintain that molding profile. Well, no one told that contractor. And so when the contractor went into that particular building, that molding was way worse and they had to take it all down. But no one told the contractor he needed to make sure that he was matching exactly the original profile. So he just put something that looked similar to what had been there. And so when we were viewing those afterwards, because they specifically said in their paperwork the molding profile was going to match and it ended up not matching, we couldn't get the tax credits on all of that. We had to file amendments to fix that problem. So again, you want to be so specific that they understand what you're going to do and can give that approval and understand what you're doing, but not so specific that you, um, you're roping yourself into this very elaborate specific plan that you'll have to file multiple amendments to fix. Example of that here on this thing, if you hadn't included that include all repairs and underlayment and just left it at put new three tab asphalt shingles on, what if your roofer got up there and saw, oh, your roof framing is totally shot. We got to fix this. We got to fix that. And technically that wasn't approved in that line for roofing. So again, making you know, bordering that line between too specific, but not specific enough. And then that last column is estimated cost. And it is just that. All you are doing is writing the number of what you think it's going to cost you. Do not include quotes or estimates or any paperwork like that. You do not have to justify that cost. You just need to tell them what you think it's going to cost. The only reason you're even giving them the numbers is so they can make sure you're spending $5,000 and at least 5% on the exterior. That's why the numbers are even there. The preservation people don't care how much it costs or if it's too much or not enough or whatever. So again, making sure that you just put that number and not include any supporting documentation for it. That next example of masonry and repointing, those photos show whatever's happening with the masonry. Uh, what's the existing condition? The mortar is loose on the rear of the building. Super simple and straightforward. What are you gonna do to fix it? You're gonna repoint and repair as needed. New mortar will match the historic mortar in all qualities, including strength, color, texture, and tooling. That last sentence, that second sentence is magic. And you should look to that kind of sentence and incorporate that into your own description because that sentence tells Shippo that you understand that the standards of rehabilitation want you to repair, retain, repair, and repair. I can't speak today, <laughs> retain, repair, and replace in kind. So that's, that's great phrasing that tells Shippo that you know what you're doing, that you know that we need to match what's there. And again, just the simple cost, you're not putting in uh, documents proving or justifying that number. And then again, that last example, porch repair, what's wrong? It's rotted and wooded out, you know, railings are all rotted. What are we gonna do? We're gonna repair and replace in kind. Those repairs are gonna be made in kind to match the historic. Again, great. Those two sentences are great sentences that you should borrow and incorporate into how you're describing your work you're doing as well. Um, now onto the photographs of it. So you have to have um, photographs of uh, not just the, the individual elements and aspects of the building that you're working on, but you also need to include some general views of your house, right? So the first five photographs that every single tax credit application should include, uh, the first one is kind of a general view from across the street or maybe the sidewalk, a, bill, a picture that shows your house in the mil middle with part of the house's neighboring next door. Again. They're in Albany. They're not coming here to review and do a site visit or anything like that. So they have no idea what your building looks like. If they do have a picture of your building from the nomination, it's one photograph that was taken when the building was nominated. So they don't have current photographs of what your house looks today. So we need to give them that. So one photo that's just a general view, clearly documenting how your house sits on the lot, on the street, just giving that kind of lay of the land. And then the next four pictures are going to be clear shots of each elevation of the building. So one of the front of your house where the whole entire front of your house is cleanly in the view of that image. Same for the back of your house and for the sides. Certainly for all those of us that live in a more urban environment, uh, your houses can be very close to, together. So there might be 
one side of your house where you're not going to be able to get a nice clean picture like you would the front of the house. That's perfectly fine. Stand at the end of that little alleyway crawl space between your, you and your neighbor's house and just take a picture looking down. Some sort of picture so they can understand is that what's happening on the exterior of that elevation because whatever's happening on the exterior of that elevation might also relate to something that's happening on the inside. So we just need to give them both of those views. Um, other than those five photographs that document your building, every other photograph is just gonna relate to what's on your building and, and what you're working on and giving those detailed shots to show what is that damage, what is that issue. So if we go back to this example list, you know, the roofing, you're gonna see the roof in all of those five you know, principal photos of your house. So if you're doing a roofing project, you're gonna probably be listing just pictures one through five as, as your reference photos. Masonry repointing, again, going and taking some close up pictures showing that damage in the mortar. If you're doing that porch repair element, a couple of close up shots or, you know, whatever, you know, use your artistic eye to figure out what are those pictures that you need to include to convey that rotted wood floor and those railings and the steps and to convey what is the, the issue happening there. If you are doing a work as part of your tax credit project that is not necessarily because something is broken or messed up. Um, you're just updating, you, you want to refresh your kitchen, you want to update a bathroom, you want to, you know, freshen and refinish your floors, there's not necessarily a problem with it, that's perfectly fine. You still need to include some general photographs so they understand what's happening in your kitchen, um, so that they can see are there character defining features in that kitchen that we need to be mindful to preserve and retain. Um, and then they'll be able to evaluate your work based on that. So again, don't, if you're just updating your kitchen, don't, you don't need to take pictures of every ding or scratch on your cabinets, just general photographs showing what's happening in your kitchen is, is what you need to do. Um, and as I said in the beginning, all of those photographs can be digital, burned onto a thumb drive or a CD if you have a CD burning capability. I don't even think I do anymore, um, but do not. I know I just saw my thing. It says if printing must be color, they no longer want. They would tolerated printed photographs for a hot minute, but they are no longer tolerating them. So do not submit a printed pile of photographs on a thumb drive burned onto a CD, or they are accepting cloud photographs, but you need to like email them first and, and tell them who you are and that you're submitting your application. And, and here's my Dropbox of photographs or whatnot. Um, again, because you're doing a keyed site plan, all those pictures need to be labeled. Numbering them is just the most logical way. And again, if your project requires it uh, and you are making changes, you need to include those architectural drawings or cut sheets that explain what that work is going to look like at the end. Uh, here are two examples of a site plan. It's the same exact house. The left-hand side is literally a pencil drawn drawing on a plain sheet of paper that was submitted in the part one and part two forms. And then for the part three, we just jazzed it up and recreated it on a computer. Um, so yeah, no matter which level of fanciness you're going to use, both are perfectly acceptable. Um, if you have blueprints and, and draw and your floor plans professionally made, by all means use those. But again, just a simple drawing on a piece of paper is gonna work perfectly fine. Um, so you put all of that together, the application, the paper application form that you've signed with ink, um, your, uh, the thumb drive of your pictures, your keyed site plan, any other things that you have to include, the architectural drawings if you have to, and your check for $25 if you have to pay that $25, you send that away to Albany. As long as what you're proposing meets the standards of rehabilitation, you'll get a letter that looks similar to this, where they're approving your project and letting you start work. This letter is a little bit more complicated because this applicant had included things that technically were not eligible or that there were uh, ambiguous phrasing in their, in their application package. So SHPO took the opportunity here to clarify so that everyone was on the same page, like this is not, a, you know, the garage, you're, you can do your garage, but it's not going to be part of the tax credit eligible stuff and whatnot. But for most people, you're just going to get a very simple version saying you're approved. And then you can go off and do work. Um, the preservation people are not going to come after you if you start work before you get approved, but God's forbid you get audited and tax and finance sees that you started work or paid for work before you got approved, then you'll have some explaining to do. Um, so again, if you are in a, a very tight punch, there's definitely wiggle room on, on starting things, emergency type things. Um, 
but if you start work that SHPO might not be okay with and might not approve, you know, it's best to just wait to get your approval before you start uh, with your hiring your people and having them start work. All right, so you've done your job, you know, you did all the work, um, all the things that you want to get tax credits on and that was approved by SHPO is, has completed, so you want to um, file your part three to close this out. It's two pieces of paper. The first page is super simple. So just clear fill in the blank stuff about yourself. The big thing on this is your project number. You need to put that and that project number is gonna be on that approval letter right here. Um, so again, making sure when you get this approval letter that your project number is listed, that there wasn't some computer emerging error that missed that number. So you need to put that number on this application. And then another spreadsheet where you list out what you did with those after photographs and what those final costs are. Um, this, uh, and again, it's gonna be that same package, the application form, the after photographs with your key site plan, and then your fee for this application. And this fee is based on how much money your final project cost is. So if you spent $5,000 to $10,000, $25 fee, next level is 75 and so on and so forth. I know some of you are probably looking at that $475 fee and being like, that's bananas. But for those people, <clears throat> for those people, you're talking about getting a $50,000 credit. So compared to what the credit amount they're getting, that fee isn't that bad. Um, so it, it does kind of give you a little sticker shock, but that's because they're getting a substantial tax credit for spending that much. Let us look at this example of how do we, you know, we talked about how you fill out the part one, for those work, then how do you fill out the part three? So on part one for roofing, it was worn out and leaking and we were gonna put a new roof on it and we thought it was gonna cost about $10,000. Our uh, follow-up, again, listing whatever those photographs that are gonna show the roof. What did you do? You remove the old roof and you put a new asphalt shingles on. Could you describe that in much more detail of every step they took to put the new asphalt shingles? Sure you could, do you need to? No. And then listing that final cost. Again, you're just listing the final cost. Do not include invoices, canceled checks, you know, credit card statements showing you paid it. They don't care if you actually paid it or that you paid it. They just need to know what the number was so they can do the math to make sure you spent $5,000 and 5% on the exterior. In this example, everything is nice whole numbers. That never happens in real life. So again, make sure that you're that the invoice you did get, the, the bill you did get from your contractors and stuff is clear and updated and that you're accurately putting the exact number you paid for. You paid 50 cents, you know, $12,050. That's what you should get the credit on, right? Next example, the next line for the masonry pointing, what did they do? They All the loose and damaged mortar was repointed to match the original in all aspects. Again, perfectly simple and to the point. You're including after photographs. So you, they're going to have the visuals of what you did. So you don't need to belabor and describe at length what you did. They'll have that visual um, documentation of it. But again, you need to just basically articulate what you did. Um, yes, that's all I'm going to say with that one. I'm going to answer Mary's question here now because it fits with this. Uh, Mary's question is, if I have several large projects and plan to complete one a year, do I submit all the projects together in one application or each project separately? Do I claim the tax credit after I finish one project or after I complete all the projects on the application? Now, there's a, a couple of different ways that you can do that, right? Um, if you have uh, you know, five things, you know, uh, you know, you have your big laundry list of what you want to do, but you know that you can't afford to do it all in one year and you need to break it up. And, and with that, you want to be able to get the credit at the end of the year. <laughs> you don't want to wait all those years. You know, if you have a bunch of stuff to do and it'll take you maybe five years from start to finish to do all that work, you could put it all in one application form, wait till you finish all of it, and then after five years, close it out and then you'll get your big credit. Or you could, you know, do the math, divide up all of that big laundry list and, you know, package it in little five or, you know, smaller amounts, making sure that you're spending over $5,000 and that 5% 5 of what you're spending is on the exterior. And you could divide those up into smaller applications and each year submit 
uh, you know, right now I'm going to do this thing. And then when I finish those three things, I'll close out that application, claim that credit. And then in a year or two, I'll move on to the next batch of things. So it's all kind of about what money you have and how you want to run your project and when you want to be able to see that tax credit, right? The other thing to be mindful of, and I'm just going to go back to this little chart with the fees. If ultimately at the end of it, you think you're going to end up spending over $200,000 for all of that work you want to do. If you put that all on one application form, you're going to get capped at $50,000 for your tax credit. So even if you spend over $200,000, you're not going to get more than that in your tax credit. But if you split it up into smaller packets, <laughs> then you're gonna get that full credit because you're not gonna reach that limit. So again, it's all about what, what you can financially afford, the specific projects that you wanna do. But again, you have that ability to either do it all together once or to parse it off into multiple application forms. Really great question. Um, all right, so you filled out your part three. Um, uh, one last thing I'll say about the part three, uh, you know, you have to include those after photographs. You already have your keyed site plan, right? So you're literally just going to go to those same exact spots and take the same exact picture showing the after. All right, so put that all in an envelope, mail it off to Albany, and then as long as you did what you said you were going to do that they approved for you to do, you will get a letter that looks like this, a certificate of completion. So again, it's the preservation people saying uh, and certifying that your project met the rules, that you did what you were going to do, and that your total project, that project cost, is then eligible for the tax credits. They are not going to tell you what your credit amount is um, or anything like that. That's not their job. Their job is to review the project and make sure that the amount you spent and the work you did met the standards. So when you get this letter, the COC from SHPO, you want to pay attention to the year on that letter. Um, Whatever year that that letter is issued, that is the year you have to claim it in your tax return. So this letter example is from 2017. If this individual, when then filing their 2017 tax return at the end of the year, forgot to include this tax credit, bye bye you cannot then on the next year try to claim it. It has to be claimed in the year that you got this letter. You want to make sure that this number that they include, your total project cost, is not only accurate, that your receipts are the same number, <laughs> but that it is the accurate number that you wrote on your form, um, that, that there isn't a typo or something like that. Because whatever number is written on this piece of paper is what you can then go to your taxes and say, like, this is the project cost that's tax credit eligible. So we need to make sure that that number is accurate for errors, you know, grant, you know, typo errors, and also math errors, that you did tally that up correctly and it's the accurate number you spent. Um, in that question of accurate number you spent, if you are also paying contractors to do non-tax credit eligible work along with your tax credit eligible work, you need to make sure that either you have itemized and separated out those costs or that contractor has given you an itemized bill. So again, let's back to that example of a kitchen remodel. Most of what you're going to do in that kitchen remodel is going to be tax credit eligible except for your appliances, right? Because your stove your refrigerator, those are not permanent improvements to that house. Those are removable elements. So those are not tax credit eligible, but you most likely paid that same contractor the money to buy them for you or install them for you. So you need to make sure that that money you paid for that work is not factored into this paperwork that you didn't mathematically add it in there. So again, double checking those numbers. And then the form is also gonna reference the IT schedule form, the, the tax form that you're gonna use if you're doing your own taxes uh, that you would use. And so that's what this form looks like this year, uh, the 2021 form, again, making sure that you're using the correct form in the year that you're filing your taxes. So if you closed out your credit in 2021 and you're claiming it on your 2021 tax return, you need to use the 2021 form. Tax and finance can be a little jerk and if you use the form from a different year, they could say, nope, sorry, you used the wrong year of the form. We're not going to give you the credit. So again, dot your I's, cross your T's, make sure you're using all of the right forms. Um, all right, so that is the end of that tax credit process, right? I'm going to talk about for just a couple of slides about when you have an income producing aspect to your home. Let's say you have a rental unit, you rent out upstairs. Uh, maybe you do Airbnb in your house sometimes. Maybe you have a home office, 
especially now with the pandemic, many of you, many of us have worked from home offices and are then claiming that work from home space on your taxes. Um, so it's you know very common and likely that you might have an income producing aspect to your personal, your home, your, your home. You still can use the tax credit, the homeowner tax credit, but there's gonna be a little bit more math because you're not gonna be able to use the tax credit in that income producing aspect of your home. But you will be able to use the tax credit in what you do in your unit and partially on the shared unit. So looking at this 50-50 split, super easy, right? I live downstairs, I rent out the upstairs, that's all there is to my house. Um, I can use the credit and apply the credit to everything I spend in my homeowner unit. I can't use it on my income producing unit. And then for the shared expenses, so the exterior or shared spaces, you can only claim the credit on the same percentage that you occupy. So if you occupy 50% of your house, you can only claim the credit on 50% of those costs. And then similarly for other you know, proportion breaks down, if one third, two third, you can only apply um, that percentage. This will make more sense with actual numbers. So here is that 50-50 split. You're spending $10,000 to upgrade your unit. As long as all of those are qualified expenditures, you'll be able to get the credit on all of that money. Exterior work, you're spending $8,000 to paint the house and the shared spaces, you're gonna you know, install floor to floor carpeting in the basement. So it's a nicer storage unit or something like that. So you might be spending $8,000, but because you only occupy 50% of the property, you can only claim the credit on 50% of that cost. So when all said and done, you might be spending $19,000 on your project, but only 14,000 of it is tax credit eligible. And it is this prorated, this adjusted number that must meet that five and five rule, over $5,000 and 5% on the exterior. So when you're doing this income producing aspect, that's where you get the icky part because that exterior cost, that exterior work, you're only gonna be able to claim it on a portion of it. So you need to make sure that that portion is at least 5%. And here are those same exact numbers, but with a one third, two third split. So you're still spending that same $8,000 on the exterior, but because you only occupy a third of it, you can only claim the credit on a third of that. So yeah, same project spending $19,000, but this project, you're only going to have 13,000 as your tax credit eligible expenses. And with that, oh, one last thing, just again, uh, uh, the very, very brief kind of general roadmap of what the commercial tax credit project is. Like I said before, that one has three distinctive application forms. So you have to submit one, get approval of that form, submit the next, get the approval of that one, and so forth. But the nitty gritty, how that all works is basically lines up with how the homeowner tax credit works as well. All right, that is the end of this evening. I will have a, two little plugs for you. Uh, we do offer tax credit uh, application preparation services. Uh, there are several uh, preservation consultants in town that we can give you the names of. We can give you those recommendations of people you could hire to do this for you. We are also one of those individuals. Um, most uh, contractors, most uh, consultants will structure their fee based on a percentage of what you're gonna spend on your project. Um, and so for some homeowners, that ends up being a considerable amount of their project. And so how we do our preparation services is based on not the amount of money you're going to spend, but how many lines you're filling on that spreadsheet. Uh, we have a sliding scale uh, rate, uh, completely negotiable. We're not really doing this. Obviously, we're a nonprofit. We need money. Please hire us. But this is not here to be a moneymaker. It's here to make sure that there is an affordable option for hiring someone to do your tax credit application for you if you so want to. Um, so you can reach out to us um, to, to ask questions and talk about that. Also another thing to keep in mind for members of PBN, if you are a current member of PBN, you can send your application to me before you send it to SHPO and get a complimentary review. Uh, not just to check and make sure that what you're doing meets the standards of rehabilitation, but also that um, you didn't mess up anything. Or you know, when you look at something for so long, you become blind to the errors and typos and stuff. So we can be another set of eyeballs to make sure your application uh, meets all of the requirements. And then lastly, I just wanted to put a plug for our preservation passport program. Um, it is a new program that we started last year. Uh, that uh, is similar to the National Park Passport System, where they have the book of all the different na national parks that you can go to. We have our preservation passport of all the National Register Historic Districts in Western New York. 
And then every year we're going to highlight a few of those with these travel logs. And in our 2021, our inaugural season, we highlighted the Jamestown Downtown Historic District. Um, so you can buy those on our website um, and be able to explore, uh, you know, historic districts in your community and, and across the region as well. And with that, I will close out this evening. Thank you so very much uh, for joining us tonight. Um, my contact information is on the screen there. Please feel free to reach out with any questions about your tax credits or any other preservation uh, related things. Uh, for those of you in this room right now, I'll leave it open if there's any last questions, but otherwise, thank you and have a great night.